Hi guys, welcome to ENT Roundtable. Uh, so with this video, we're starting the Vertigo series. Now I am very pleased to have with me Dr. Nilotpal Datta. Uh, he is a consultant neurotologist practicing in Medica Super Specialty, Kolkata. Uh, Dr. Datta is a DLO, MS ENT, MR CPS, and MR CS ENT, and he's been trained in pediatric vestibular disorders from Alder Hay Children's Hospital in Liverpool. We have been having this conversation of educating our juniors and especially the postgraduate students regarding this uh, untouched topic uh, in vertigo and balance disorders, mainly the audio vestibular medicine part, which most of the institutes during the residency or even in our undergraduate MBBS days doesn't give much of importance. And even during our DLO or MS examinations, we are also seldom very limitedly asked regarding this disorder. So, right. our initiative was to create a basic awareness regarding these diseases and what are all these uh, audio vestibular medicine is all about. As a neurotologist, I want to ask you, how do you approach a patient who comes to you with vertigo? So if a patient is experiencing a true vertigo, he comes to us and we are diagnosing it that it's yes, it's a case of true vertigo, then usually those are due to diseases of the inner ear, like it could be a vestibular neuritis or acute labyrinthine failure or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo vertiginous migraine, linear disease, as all these brief spells of vertigo, like if it's for a few seconds, it usually corresponds towards or depicts towards the BPPV. Uh, if it lasts for minimum 20 minutes and uh, minimum 20 minutes to around one and a half hours or two hours with ear related symptoms, it's more towards linear disease or a linear migraine complex disorders. Sudden onset of severe rotatory vertigo lasting for 2-3 days along with ear symptoms could be due to acute labyrinthine failure or without ear symptoms vertigo lasting for 2-3 days with severe vomiting could be vestibular neuronitis. So this the second lot of patients which we are discussing here today is a case of balance disorder patients. So those are different from the patients who have come to us with a rotatory spinning. So, these imbalance patients are mostly due to any unilateral or bilateral vestibulopathy, could be due to functional dizziness, could be due to extrapyramidal disorders like drug induced Parkinsonism, multi system atrophy, or any other age related neurodegenerative symptoms like press by ataxia. So, all these disorders should never be mixed up with a rotatory vertigo. The third disorder which we will be Talking here, a majority of the patients have been referred to us from the cath lab and the cardiologist who feels like, who also tells that they are having vertiginous sim symptoms. But when you go into depth and ask them, go into a detailed history, you find those patients actually having blackouts or they have a sinking sensation or lightheadedness on standing up from a prolonged sitting or lying down position. That should never be confused with the typical rotatory vertigo and should be taken into consideration these symptoms are detailed cardiac workout and the vestibular evaluation is mandatory. So, in a nutshell, for a proper exact diagnosis, two things are very important. One is the history, spend time with your vertigo patients, get into as much as possible into their history. And to confirm your clinical findings, go through a test battery approach of the vestibular function tests. Right. So we'll come to the test battery approach that uh, Dr. Dutta is talking about. We'll see what tests are done and in which case, which tests have to be done and how to do them. We'll also demonstrate that. But before that, I would like to ask you, uh, what are the pointers in history which points toward a functional, you know, uh, dizziness? You talked about functional disorders. So, how, how can you judge that a patient might be having a functional cause rather than an organic cause? See. The functional dizziness, the first rule is that the patient comes to you not with a rotatory giddiness, but you will tell that he is having non-rotatory unsteadiness. That is a persistent 
feeling of swaying sensation for at least three months and the swaying sensation is waxing and waning but sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down he has de will be developing extreme fear of fall which will be aggravated in open areas like marketplaces shopping malls going into railway stations your ports where it gets aggravated sometimes these are also triggered by a sudden passage of a car or a train in front of your eyes when you look and it causes dizziness increases the dizziness and also they are triggered by some zigzag cartoons or playing of action movies these usually are more common in the younger population who are having a uh, excessive stress or excessive uh, pressure whether it's physical or emotional so these patients are usually from the age group of 20 to 40 years so dr datta uh, could you please tell me how often do you prescribe vestibular sedatives because as ents we have seen a lot of patients roaming around and taking burton and stemidel for months together with no relief so how often do you use them the current consensus and the publications on the scientific data says that vestibular sedatives should be given in case of acute vertigo and that should never be more than 3 to 4 days or 3 to 5 days at most because it delays the vestibular compensation a uh, yes the role of vestibular sedatives is very important but it should be in case of acute vertigo which has other vegetative symptoms like nausea vomiting sweating then only there is a actual role of vestibular sedatives if you are again i am saying if you are giving a antibiotic or drug to a patient who actually have imbalance and not a vertigo issue then it is going to deteriorate the patient's condition rather than curing it right uh, so if not vestibular sedatives what are the categories of drugs you know what is the uh, classes of drugs that you prescribe in different conditions could you please talk about that yes it depends on again the diseases which we are diagnosing and our treatment to it is disease specific in some of the diseases like bppv we do not prescribe any drugs no role of medications in patient with benign paroxysmal positional vertigo they are fully treated in my clinical practice i give a patient 24 hours deadline if the maneuvers whatever may be if they have maybe a please yakovino or a gufonis maneuver or barbecue whatever depending on which canal either posterior canal lateral canal or anterior canal whichever is affected if we can do the proper maneuvers within 24 to 48 hours the patient is going to be fully all right no medications is required now in cases of peripheral disorders like vestibular neuronitis or acute vestibular syndrome for the first 2 3 weeks we may go for steroids sometimes antiviral or sometime uh, agents which improve the blood circulations in the peripheral and arteries so this can be given in case of acute vestibular neuronitis or acute vestibular syndrome now it when it comes to the diseases like meniere's disease diuretics are the main line of the treatment in case of migraine we give migraine prophylactic drugs like topiramide divalprex sodium and venlafaxine flunazine all these drugs depending on patient symptoms if the patients have a migraine anxiety oriented disorder we prefer to use benzodiazepines and snris coming on to functional dizziness a uh, course of benzodiazepines combined with snris along with vestibular rehabilitation helps us in a long way now depending on central causes of vertigo central causes of vertigo we needs to find out if it's a case where the extra pyramidal symptoms are being affected and the patients have a bradykinesia slowness of movements or cog wheel rigidity or a tremor of the hands or any abnormal movement of the body parts like chin or facial muscles so all those are usually a neurologist colleague has to be taken into consideration and uh, there are some causes of vertigo which are due to down bit or up bit nystagmus where we use drugs like lyofen 
clonazepam, then gawa pentin. So all these drugs are required. So it again depends on what you are getting in the clinical history, what you are getting in the clinical examination, and after the vestibular test, battery approach, what you exactly come up with. Once you have that in your hand, that this is my diagnosis and this is the way for which the probably the patient is having a balance disorder or vertigo problem, then disease specific treatment can be given. And again, limit the use of vestibular sedatives to max of 3 to 4 days or 5 days. Right, so that's a very good point and it has to be kept in mind. Now, talking about the you know test battery approach that you have been talking about, so I would like to ask you. Uh, which test do you have in your armament? Which test are you doing regularly for the patients? See, first of all, getting into the test battery approach, we need to think back again into the pathophysiology of vertigo and balance disorders. Why it's happening? Why you have vertigo? Or why you have an imbalance problem? It's basically due to the inner ears. Like in the inner ears, we're having the semicircular canals like this, along with the utricles and saccules. Then you have a part of the brain, like the very brainstem cerebellum, where the vestibular nuclei are present, which play a very much important role in maintenance of balance disorders, along with the psychic and the cognitive system. So all this system helps a person to maintain his balance. So it needs to be checked the entire parts, like the inner ear, we have different tests for the semicircular canals, different tests for the autolytes, the saccular and the uticles, different tests like oculomotor examinations to entirely check whether there is a problem with the brainstem or cerebellar lesion and some psychometric analysis to find out the cause of any anxiety or preoccupied depression. Now coming on to the basic test battery should have in a vertigo lab or the video nystagmography where we basically see the oculomotor examinations and the caloric tests where we test the sensitivity of the lateral semicircular canals in low frequencies of vestibular simulation. Then we have the dynamic visual acuity where we see the all the semicircular canals, six semicircular canals of both the ears. We are able to test the functional utility of those semicircular canals and efficacy at mid frequencies of vestibular stimulation. Then subjective visual vertical, uh, there is another test where we can test the perception of stability of a person which again is a combination function from the higher cortical centers in the brain and the utricles. Now coming on to the evoke potential machines like the cervical VEM and ocular VEM test which are specifically testing the inferior uh, oblique muscle and the sternocleidomastoid muscle where we basically test the superior and the inferior vestibular nerve and eventually we can help a good understanding about the saccular and the uh, utricular system. Now in some patients who are you are suspecting a case of Meniere's disease then a pure tone audiometry and the electrocochleography where we measure the summiting potential and action potential and find out if there is any hydropic changes in the inner ear and that help us in diagnosis of a Meniere's disease. So again, few of the tests are to be done in mostly of the patients to rule out any peripheral pathology or any central vestibular problem. And in few tests like the electrocochleography, glycerol or the pure tone audiometry, you can keep aside for patients who are specifically with the hydrophobic ear disease and Meniere's disease. Another last test which have been recently added to the vestibular protocol is the postiography and the stabilometry test. These tests help us to find out any kind of central ataxia or a phobic postural ataxia or anything that has gone to related with anything related to a cerebellum, brainstem or vermis regions which are actually causing uh, imbalance because we can now record it and have a view of the entire balance system can be marked graphically in the computer which we will show you later on in our later videos how we can document a patient's body stability in the computer system and later can evaluate whether he is having actual instability or it's due to any kind of psychogenic or functional issues.
right so that was a very detailed explanation about the tests i think uh, you know uh, we can conclude this video this was about the basic approach how to uh, you know uh, approach a patient with vertigo the test which can be done the drugs which can be given and it is not just uh, you know doing, uh, doing a dexol pike and fps and giving the patient what and there is a it's the, this is a science much more beyond that uh, thank dr datta i uh, thank you thank dr datta for uh, you know, giving us the time thank so you. this is a part one of the series this is just the first video we'll be taking on uh, individual topics one by one we'll be also talking about the physiology and individual diagnosis and we'll be demonstrating each and every test in detail how to do it and how to interpret it because at the end the test also they don't give you a diagnosis in one word you have to interpret them and correlate them with the history and examination that you have done so stay tuned for that uh, thank you uh, dr datta thank you